This woman left her baby at home to die while she went on a 10 day holiday. This case is obviously absolutely infuriating. Crystal Candelario is a 32 year old woman from Ohio. She worked as a substitute teacher at an elementary school. Last year, she decided to do what many people do during the summer months and go on a holiday. On the 6th of June, she headed off on holiday to the Caribbean and left her home in Cleveland. The only issue was that she seemingly didn't care that she was leaving her 16 month old unattended alone at home while she went. Her adorable little girl was called Jalen. Now Crystal did not come home until 10 days later when she discovered unsurprisingly her child was unresponsive. When paramedics arrived at the scene they pronounced the child dead. The girl was obviously extremely dehydrated and she was found in a playpen in blankets that were completely soiled. Crystal was arrested and charged with the girl's murder and other related offences. She was sacked from her job and pleaded guilty to one count of aggravated murder and one count of endangering children. She's due to be sentenced in March and if convicted of aggravated murder, she could face life in prison. This little girl went missing in 2017, but she was just found alive after being recognized from a recent Unsolved Mysteries episode on Netflix. Kayla Unbihan was nine years old when she was reportedly abducted by her mom in Wheaton, Illinois. She was last seen on the 4th of July on a camping trip while spending the holiday with her mom, who at the time only had certain visitation rights. Kayla's mom and dad separated just a few weeks after she was born, but what ensued was a lengthy and nasty custody battle. But when July 5th, 2017 came and Heather failed to return home with their daughter, Kayla was reported missing and a warrant was issued for Heather's arrest. But the two seemingly vanished into thin air. Over the years, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children kept releasing age enhanced photos of Kayla in hopes of finding her. And just last year, her case was also featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix about parents who've abducted their kids. But just last weekend, a store owner in Asheville, North Carolina, recognized Kayla after having watched her episode on Netflix and called the police. And six years after her disappearance, Kayla has officially been located safe. Her mom, Heather, has been arrested and was charged with one count of child abduction. She's being held on a $250,000 bond while awaiting extradition to Illinois. On Kayla's 15th birthday earlier this year, her dad posted this tribute on the Facebook page dedicated to finding her, called Bring Kayla Home. This TikToker was killed while she was making a TikTok video. This is 15-year-old Yasmin Esmeralda. So Yasmin lived in Mexico, and various news reports after the crime stated that Yasmin was almost infatuated with the cartel. One day, Yasmin was with her younger brother at her grandmother's house, and the two decided to start looking around the home. But when they were rummaging through a closet, they discovered that her grandmother had a submachine gun. It was a massive Uzi submachine gun to be specific. And I'd show you a photo of it. You can look it up online, but I'll get banned from TikTok. So Yasmin decided that she wanted to have her brother film her while she played around with this weapon. Obviously, this is a terrible idea that you should never do. And sadly, while Yasmin was playing with the gun and her younger brother was filming, the gun fired and it ended up taking Yasmin's life. It's still completely unknown as to why she wanted to play with the gun and why she wanted to make a TikTok video with it. But like I said, experts and people from the area have stated that locals are almost infatuated with the cartels there. And it's possible that Yasmin thought that toting this gun was a symbol of some sort of success. This teenager showed no remorse after killing his mum over school results. Gregory Ramos was 15 years old living in Florida. His mum was Gail Clevenger, aged 46. On the 2nd of November 2018, the pair got into an argument over his school results. He later stated to detectives the following. So I got home, I got into an argument with my mum. She slapped me across the face, she began to hit me, she started beating me, I didn't like that. He then calmly told officers that he had therefore strangled her to death. He described placing her body in a wheelbarrow and then into a car. He explained to officers that he'd had a mental breakdown and almost self-unalived three times. He called two of his friends following the murder to try and help him cover it up. He buried her body behind a church and then tried to stage a robbery. When he initially called police, he told them that he had returned home and the house had been burgled. However, his story would soon unfold and the police interviewed the friends and none of their stories matched up. Gregory eventually admitted to the true horrific events that had occurred. In December 2020, he pleaded guilty to first-degree murder, abuse of a body, and tampering with evidence. He was given 45 years in prison. He's apparently been very productive since being in custody and is working towards a high school diploma. If I didn't know better, I would think this true crime case came straight out of a horror film. Zachary Jones is a 34-year-old man from Lincoln County. 
there was recently a terrifying discovery made at his home. In December 2023, a 16-year-old girl left her house in North Carolina. She was living with her grandparents and they'd actually had an argument, so she left. After leaving the house, she seemingly vanished into thin air. The grandparents reported her missing on the 6th of December and police started looking into what may have happened. No one had any idea that Zachary Jones had allegedly been talking to the girl for three weeks. They'd met online and he told her he was a lot younger than what he was. After her argument with her grandparents, he allegedly lured her to meet him and drove her back to his place in Kentucky. He allegedly SA'd her multiple times and gave her substances. Then on Christmas Day, Zachary's mum rang police. She rang to report a DV incident between Zachary and the girl, who she believed was his girlfriend. When police arrived, they arrested Zachary and discovered the young girl hidden under a trap door, concealed under a rug. The girl claimed that Zachary had threatened her with a weapon and forced her to tell his family she was 18. Zachary tried to claim to police that she'd hidden under the trap door of her own free will. The teenager was rescued, reunited with her family, and Zachary is facing 30 charges and being held in jail. This one's going to be kind of gruesome, so definitely for this. The main focus of the story, which is Travis the Chimp. Travis basically got mad famous because of how smart he was. He could dress himself, he could brush his own teeth, he knew how to drive cars. What the f***? People would even say like, oh, he listens more than a toddler. Really? On February 16, 2009, 911 got a call from a lady in distress, Sandra Harold, and you could hear in the background monkey noises. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. What's the problem with your friend? I need to know. Her friend, Charla Nash, was over, and Travis was acting a little off, and Sandra actually said that she had laced some tea that she gave Travis with Xanax. Also, Charla Nash that day had a different hairstyle. She also came in a different car. Charla Nash was over there to try to help get him back in the house and lure him in with his favorite toy. So she had it, like, on her face, and that's when he basically, like, lashed out, fucking rushed at her. He ended up taking her eyes out, her lips, uh... most of her upper face, took off her ears. She had no hands. Wait, and what? Sandro, she said that she tried her best efforts of taking Travis off of Charla by hitting him with a shovel, stabbing him a couple of times. And that shit was not working? Nothing was working, bro. Wait, hold up. How big was the chimpanzee? So he weighed 200 pounds. Whoa, what the f***? No matter how big or small, bro, they're mad strong, bro. The cops arrive. He stops. He goes over to the police car and he... So tomorrow's episode of the show is not for everybody. It's not for the faint of heart. It is not going to be for your average ghost hunting fan. This episode deals with some of the most disturbing subject matter we've ever covered, but it's very important that we talk about this stuff. Tomorrow's episode deals with the Delphi murders in Delphi, Indiana, a case that Courtney and I have covered on murder in America. And it's, it's disturbing. The details that we uncovered through our own personal investigation, they are shocking. There's graphic content that we're going to be covering in the episode. Um, there's evidence that we captured at the crime scene that may link a suspect to the crime. It's some groundbreaking, world-changing stuff um, that if you believe in the paranormal and, and you think that it's possible that we are talking to spirits, which I obviously definitely think is, uh, this episode will, will shock you to your core. Um, but I just wanted to warn everybody, let everybody know, an episode will be out tomorrow at 8 p.m. CST, Central Standard Time. We're super excited to share it with y'all. I'm on, like I said, my first vacation in a year with Courtney right now, but we're still getting the episode out. It's completely edited. Um, and I want everybody to show up and uh, help us break a record tomorrow. But I love you guys. And just be prepared before, before the video tomorrow. Be prepared mentally. Uh, it's gonna get dark. See you at 8 p.m. tomorrow. This case will make you terrified to walk to your car alone. On November the 22nd, 2019, 19-year-old Ruth George was attending an event. Her family were then very concerned when she didn't return home the following day. Now, the event had been put on by a fraternity from the University of Illinois. Ruth had said bye to her friends at the end of this party and they all went their separate ways. Ruth was then left alone to walk to her car. Ruth was last seen alive walking towards her vehicle. Her family reported her missing to police. Police tracked her phone to the same parking garage that she had been seen walking to her car in. Upon investigation, they discovered that her car was actually still parked there. 
When they took a closer look, they discovered something shocking. Ruth's body was in the back seat of the car and there were clear signs of a struggle and an SA had occurred. Her cause of death was determined to be strangulation. Investigators examined CCTV footage of the evening. They discovered that Ruth was not alone when walking to her car. A man was following closely behind Ruth. He entered the parking garage just seconds after Ruth and he then, 35 minutes later, was captured on CCTV running away from the scene. The suspect was Donald Thurman, aged 26. He was arrested and charged with first degree murder and aggravated SA. His defence was that he saw her, thought she was pretty and when he tried to speak to her she ignored him and he was angry at being ignored. He has confessed to killing her and as far as I can see online he is being held without bail and he is waiting sentencing. These are the craziest survival stories you will ever hear, part one. On September 25th, 2000, 19-year-old Kevin Hines attempted to take his own life by jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. He plummeted over 220 feet at 75 miles per hour, crashing into the water and severely damaging three of his vertebrae, narrowly avoiding a complete spinal cord injury by millimeters. Remarkably, he survived this harrowing fall. In the aftermath of his plunge, Kevin found himself fighting for his life. His wet clothes weighed him down, dragging him under the chilly waters of the San Francisco Bay. He struggled to break the surface, gasping for breath, clinging to his newfound desire to live. Suddenly, he felt an unusual force from below lifting him above the water surface, where he remained until the Coast Guard arrived. It was only later that he discovered the mysterious presence keeping him afloat was actually a sea lion. The sea lion had been supporting his body until the rescue boat arrived, as several eyewitnesses had observed. This extraordinary survival story captured widespread media attention, and Kevin Hines has since dedicated himself to being a motivational speaker and a fervent advocate for a suicide prevention. This is a picture of Kevin today standing next to the Golden Gate Bridge with a smile on his face. This story just shows how precious your life is even in your darkest and lowest moments. I'm glad Kevin survived and if any of you are ever having problems, please talk to somebody. Are you familiar with the Missing 401 cases? No? Missing 411 refers to a series of unsolved cases of people who mysteriously vanished in national parks across North America. Obviously, it's common for people to get lost in like the woods because it's fucking huge, right? Yeah, bro. You could like fall on the wrong side, get eaten by an animal too. But it's just the way they went missing, how they were found, how their remains were found. Like this one case about a guy, his name is Aaron Hedges. Back in 2014, he was elk hunting in the crazy mountains in Montana. He was really familiar with this specific area. He got so familiar to the point where like he didn't need a map. So there's no way he could just get lost. No, bro. Like, and he even set up these caches and different parts of the area. It has like necessities that he might need, like sleeping bags, food, water, stuff like that. So he ended up going with two of his friends on a hiking trip and they were going to go set up camp at a lake. So they were going to go with two horses and a pack mule. It was good for the first two days. And then on the third day, Aaron decides, you know what? I'm just going to go to a cache. I'm going to go get a sleeping bag, get some other materials that we might need. I'm going to come back. A couple hours later, one of his friends ends up talking to him on the walkie talkie and this specific like walkie talkie whenever you talk it shows the gps coordinate of the other person's walkie talkie so whenever he looked at it aaron said he was going to go north to a cache but on the map he went far east from the cache he was supposed to go and then whenever they got in contact with him he was like oh sorry guys i went the wrong way on accident but how would he get lost like that exactly they go out look for him and stuff they go to where the gps showed no sign of him anywhere bro since they found nothing they eventually ended up calling the authorities they end up finding his boots and next to his boots was a campfire a pack of cigarettes that were his but it was weird because those same this might be one of the most gruesome deaths of all time and whatever you do don't look up the picture this was 18 year old nikki castores and in 2006 on halloween she crashed her father's porsche 11 driving at more than 100 miles per hour she was trying to switch lanes when she suddenly clipped another car lost control and then flew over the middle of the highway onto traffic lanes and into a concrete toll booth and when police arrived on the scene, they walked into a living nightmare. They arrived minutes later and found Nikki's body still strapped to the driver's seat. But her head, however, was no longer attached to her body. Nikki's head was completely severed in half, and it wasn't a head anymore. I can't really even describe what it looks like because it was so disturbing, words can't really describe it. The wreckage and the scene were so brutal that the coroner wouldn't let her parents identify the body. But unfortunately, her parents were not spared from seeing the gruesome scene. 
Photographs of Nikki's death had somehow found their way onto the internet and spread extremely quickly. Nobody knows how the pictures got leaked, but it's assumed to be law enforcement. But MySpace pages that were acting as some sort of tribute for Nikki's death posted the horrifying pictures of the accident. Nikki's parents then received countless emails of the photographs. And sadly, there was no escaping the trauma. I really urge you to never look up this photo because it might be one of the most disturbing things you will ever see. This case should be an eye-opener to everyone to not drive recklessly. Because as you can tell, your life can be taken from you in a split second. This is just awful and rest in peace to Nikki and all of you please stay safe. This Home Alone star has just pleaded guilty to domestic violence charges over two years after assaulting his then girlfriend. Devin Rattray rose to fame when he played Buzz in Home Alone 1 and 2. But in 2021, 30 years after he played Buzz, he was arrested on domestic violence charges. Out with his girlfriend at a bar in Oklahoma, and he'd become angry after she didn't charge two women for his arm. When they got back to their hotel room, he attacked her. He pushed her onto the bed, held one hand round her throat and the other hand over her mouth and said, this is how you die. He then took his hand off her throat and started punching her repeatedly in the face. She managed to break free and run from the room for help. She was left with a cut lip and bruises on her face and chest. He was arrested at the time, but he was later released after posting a $25,000 bond, and he denied the allegations. But just this month, he has actually pleaded guilty. He has, however, avoided jail time, and he's been sentenced to three years probation. Many of us have ignored red flags, but do you think that you could fall in love with a prisoner and help him escape from jail? This woman did just that, and it cost her her life. Casey White was 40 years old and was doing time in prison. He'd been given a 75 year sentence for robbery and attempted murder. He was also awaiting trial for charges of stabbing a woman to death during a 2015 burglary. During his time in prison, he became close with Vicky White, age 56. Now she was one of the prison guards who wasn't actually any relation of him despite their surnames. Vicky was a trusted member of staff and had worked at the Lauderdale County Jail in Alabama for years. She even received an employee of the year award four times. They ended up forming a relationship and secretly dating for two years. On the 29th of April 2022, Vicky told guards that she was taking him for a mental health assessment. She was actually sneaking him out of the prison. The pair got into a car and went on the run for a total of 11 days. They stayed in motels and changed their car three times. Now Casey actually dressed as a woman despite the fact that he was over six foot, he was absolutely huge and he was wheeled around in a wheelchair by Vicky as some sort of disguise. On the 9th of May, the law caught up with the pair when they were spotted washing their car at a car wash. A dramatic car chase ensued before Vicky actually took her life in the front of the car. Now, a retired sheriff's official claimed that Casey had actually planned to kill Vicky once they made the escape, but Casey's attorneys deny this. They said Casey loved and still does love Vicky. Casey was taken back to custody and charged with first degree prison escape as well as felony murder for Vicky's death. He was ultimately sentenced to life in prison. This is by far the most horrific thing that was ever live streamed. This absolutely horrific murder that I'm about to explain was live streamed on Instagram. This is extremely disturbing so this is a massive trigger warning. On August 11th, 2023, Bosnia bodybuilder named Nerman Selmanovic murdered his wife live on Instagram Live. All while 12,000 people watched. Nerman had been abusing his wife during their entire marriage and the pair had a young child. On the morning of August 11th, he told his followers that they could witness a live killing. As the live stream continues, he then turns the camera to his ex-wife, whose face was bloodied and disfigured from multiple injuries, probably from him repeatedly hitting her over and over again. He then starts talking to her, calling her derogatory names and blames her for her own death because she reported him to the police. And what makes this even more disturbing is throughout the entire live stream, you can hear their child just screaming, crying. He then tells his followers that he's the child's father and his ex had hidden the toddler from him for over a week. He then picks up the gun, points it at his ex-wife's head and then fires one shot into her forehead, killing her. It's absolutely horrifying and I don't recommend looking for it. After doing this, he then tells his followers on Instagram to come and save the child. A police chase then began and Nerman went on a shooting rampage. 
He continued to film and tells his viewers that he killed two other people, who actually turned out to be an innocent man and his young son. He ended up taking his own life on that same day. This is a case when after you get done researching it, you just don't feel right. This is very sad and very disturbing. Whatever you do, don't go looking for the live stream because it's honestly something you just don't want to see. So you're communicating with another recruit? I was back in, I stopped, everything got cut off, um, got rid of, I mean I didn't delete the Snapchat, I just got delete the app, so okay. I haven't used it for like, I don't know, two year and a half. That disgusting cop you just saw in that video is a hardcore pedophile. In 2021, former sheriff's deputy Jalen Fleer, who was 27 years old at the time, pled guilty to some disturbing charges. So as you heard on that body camera footage, the police were interested in Jalen's Snapchat. That's because multiple girls had come forward making accusations against Jalen. On Snapchat, Jalen had been communicating with minors, and these communications had escalated into full-on physical contact. And after this escalation, there was no going back. Like I said before, Jalen actually had four different victims, and he had graphically abused all four of them. Sadly though, the four young girls were actually scared to come forward to the police because Jalen was the police. Like I said before, Jalen was a sheriff's deputy and they knew that he was. But it was ultimately this picture from the Snapchat account linked to the interactions with minors that ended up being the nail in Jalen Fleer's coffin. He just couldn't dig himself out of this one. The judge presiding in this case said that it was one of the most disturbing, disgusting cases he's ever had to deal with. And trust me, the messages from this trial, I can't read them on here, they are graphic and absolutely horrifying. And thankfully they were able to catch this guy because only God knows what else he could have done if he weren't brought to justice. Sadly though, at the time of his arrest, Jalen had a wife and a one-year-old child. That's right, behind his wife's back, while she was caring for his baby, Jalen was running off to assault minors. And obviously, she had no idea that her husband was a closeted pedophile. This is a disturbing story, and I know that cops who break the law and end up in prison get bad treatment, and I know that pedophiles who end up in prison get bad treatment, so I think this guy's doubled down, and I hope he's facing hell behind bars. It's been revealed that killer Scarlett Blake will serve out her prison sentence in a male prison. The 25-year-old was sentenced just this month for the murder of a complete stranger after prowling the streets of Oxford looking for a victim. Scarlett, who is transgender, began taking puberty blockers at 17 and began hormone treatment at 18, but she has been told that she will serve out her prison sentence in a male prison with her own lawyer saying she's so dangerous that she will never get parole, despite being sentenced to only 24 years. Before Scarlett turned to finding a human victim, she'd actually killed a much loved family pet, taking inspiration from a Netflix series. She had live streamed herself, killing her neighbor's cat, skinning it, and then placing it inside a blender. But she decided to step things up and she created a murder kit in a backpack which included a leopard print dressing gown cord which she used to try and strangle her victim. That victim was Georges Carino and he was targeted by Scarlett randomly after he walked home from a night out. Scarlett smashed a vodka bottle over his head and then she tried to strangle him with the dressing gown cord. She then pushed him into the river where he drowned. Scarlett wasn't actually caught until two years later when she confessed what she'd done and bragged about it to her then girlfriend, who then turned her into the police. When they searched her phone, they found this image along with multiple images of female killers who Scarlett looked up to. They also found the video of Scarlett killing a cat in which she also says that she'd like to open up a human. George's family have been left absolutely devastated by his murder they described him as a wonderful person who would do anything for anyone and he was someone who just wanted to make people happy. Scarlett was sentenced just last week to life with a minimum of 24 years and it's looking very unlikely that she will ever get parole and she'll be serving her sentence out in a male prison. In the middle of the night in 1988, this 16-year-old would go on to kill his entire family with an axe. This is Kids Who Kill Part 12. The Brown family consisted of mom and dad Paulette and Bernard, 16-year-old David, his 13-year-old sister Diane, and his 11-year-old brother Rick. 
They also had a 19-year-old brother named Joe, but he had recently moved out of the home. The Broms lived together in Rochester, Minnesota, and by all accounts seemed like a happy family, but on February 18th, 1988, that would all change. After reportedly getting into an argument with his father, David would go on to brutally murder his entire family with an axe while they slept. He first went to his parents' room and attacked his dad. According to David, his dad kept getting up even though he was repeatedly being hit with the axe, but eventually he died. Then he moved on to his mom, only striking her once before going into his little brother's room, who was sleeping in the fetal position, cuddling his favorite blanket, and killing him as well. When David finished, he walked out and saw his sister standing over his mom in the upstairs hallway, and it was at this point that he killed them both. Each member of the family died from numerous axe wounds to the head, neck, and chest. After, David dyed his hair black and left the home. Early the next morning, the police were called to the home after David's school contacted them, stating that they heard a rumor that David killed his entire family. And when they arrived, they found all four bodies, including the bloody axe that was left in the basement. The only thing missing was David. At first, authorities believed that David was possibly abducted, but one of his friends came forward and stated that he confessed that morning in great detail that he had killed his entire family. This would come as a shock to many, as David was known to be extremely nice and cheerful, having a lot of friends. He would even babysit his neighbor's kids pretty often. It would take one day for David to be located and arrested for the murders. At the trial, it was debated whether or not he should be tried as a juvenile or an adult, but if he was tried as a juvenile, he would be released from prison at just 19 years old. According to a psychiatrist in the case, mental health played a factor in the murders, as David had tried to end his life twice the year prior due to depression. And although David was known as being extremely polite, he reportedly told his friends on many occasions that he was going to kill his parents, even the night of. But nobody thought that he would actually do it. David was tried as an adult at just 16 years old and was convicted of four counts of first-degree murder. He was given three consecutive life sentences and is eligible for parole after 52 years. This mother sold her five-year-old daughter to have sex for $200, and this case is absolutely gut-turning. Shania Davis, who was five years old, was reported missing in North Carolina on November 10th, 2009. Suspicion turned to a man described as her mother's boyfriend, but he was let go and police targeted another man spotted on hotel surveillance footage holding the child. Authorities then arrested Shania's mother and accused her of offering her daughter for prostitution, hoping Shania was still alive, but fearing the worst. The arrests offered a glimmer of hope that Shania would be found alive. But on November 16th, searchers discovered the girl's body off a road nearly a week after her mother reported her missing. Police acquired horrifying surveillance footage that was released to the public that showed a man carrying Shania Davis through a hotel. And that man's name is Mario McNeil. The video footage shows him carrying Shania the day she went missing. And Mario McNeil then turned himself into police and he was charged with kidnapping but he refused to help find Shania's body. Shania Davis's mother, Antoinette, was then arrested and charged with human trafficking for allegedly selling her daughter as a sex slave. Police still hoped five-year-old Shania Davis would be found alive, but that hope was dwindling. And sadly, a couple days later, the body of five-year-old Shania was found. The autopsy revealed that Shania was raped and then strangled to death by Mario McNeil, who was sentenced for murder and sentenced to death. Her mother, Antoinette, was sentenced to 17 years and had to register as a sex offender for at least 30 years. Antoinette literally sold her daughter to Mario McNeil to cover a $200 drug debt, and she said, quote, he was only supposed to have sex with her. Mario didn't kidnap Shiana. Her mother literally gave her to him. And what Mario McNeil did to poor Shiana is insanely disturbing to wrap your head around. This is the last image of Shiana alive being carried out of the hotel by Mario McNeil. This case is just absolutely awful and people like this deserve to be under the jail or dead. Rest in peace to Shiana, you did not deserve this at all. Playboy Bunny was lured into a deadly trap that ended in a double killing. Dorothy Stratton came from humble beginnings. In 1978, when she was just 18 years old, she worked at a Dairy Queen to help earn money for her family. She lived in Vancouver and she wasn't afraid of hard work. That's when she met Dan Snyder and the meeting would ultimately cost her her life. They began dating, got married and bought a house in LA together. Dan worked as a nightclub promoter and was also rumored to be involved in the S industry. He took advantage of how beautiful Dorothy was and started trying to convince her to do nude photo shoots. She eventually agreed to this after two weeks of him pressuring her. Dorothy actually began a successful modeling career. 
She was once named Playmate of the Month and caught the eye of Hugh Hefner. She started getting work as an actress and her career went from strength to strength. However, as she began getting more successful, Dan got more jealous. Their relationship became strained and Dorothy actually ended up meeting a film director named Peter Bogdanovich. Dorothy and Peter grew close and she broke up with Dan. She told him she wanted a divorce, but Dan didn't take this well at all and ended up hiring a private investigator. He emptied the couple's joint bank account and briefly started seeing an ex-girlfriend. In August 1980, he decided to buy a gun and things got incredibly sinister. Dorothy agreed to meet up with Dan one-on-one -on -one to finalise the divorce. Now, some people didn't think it was a good idea, but she'd actually told friends and family that she did want to remain friends with Dan. She drove to his place in LA, not knowing he'd actually lured her into a trap. It was around midday on the 14th of August when she arrived. At 8pm that night, Dan's roommates returned home. They saw that Dan's bedroom door was shut and they just presumed that the pair were in there discussing things and that they should leave them to their privacy. They watched TV for a couple of hours, but then they were contacted by Dan's private investigator. He got concerned because he hadn't heard from Dan all day. The roommates got a hideous shock when they opened the door of Dan's bedroom and found both people deceased. Dan had awed Dorothy, killed her and then unalived himself. When Peter was told the harrowing news about Dorothy, he actually collapsed. When he regained consciousness, he was so distraught he had to be sedated. Peter remained close with Dorothy's friends and family and actually married her younger sister years after Dorothy's death. He died of natural causes aged 82. These are murders everybody should know about and this is a massive trigger warning. This was eight-year-old Gabriel Fernandez who was born and raised in Palmdale, California and he was abused and tortured over a period of months by his own mother and her boyfriend. Gabriel lived with his grandparents until 2012 when his mother Pearl Fernandez regained custody of him despite concerns for his well-being from the family. And throughout his eight months stay in the household of his mother Pearl and her boyfriend, he was systematically tortured and abused. The abuse included regular physical beatings causing broken bones, he was also being forced to eat cat litter and feces, his own vomit, spoiled and expired foods, and he was being burnt with cigarettes and heated spoons. Also, he was shot with BB guns in various areas of his body, including the face and his groin. They also pepper sprayed him and forced him to wear women's clothing and had him sleep bounded and gagged in a very small cupboard. His teeth were also knocked out with a baseball bat. And according to Gabriel's siblings, when Gabriel's mother and her boyfriend were abusing him, they would just laugh about it like the evil humans that they are. Prosecutors said that Gabriel's mother and her boyfriend were motivated to abuse Gabriel because they believed he was gay. And on May 22, 2013, Pearl Fernandez called 911 reporting that her child Gabriel was not breathing. Gabriel was fatally beaten by his mother and her boyfriend after failing to clean up his toys. When first responders arrived, they found him on the ground naked with several injuries. Paramedics then rushed him to the hospital where doctors declared him brain dead. And Gabriel died two days later on May 24, 2013 at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. He died at just the young age of eight years old. And the official autopsy declared that he died from blunt force trauma that conceded with neglect and malnutrition. Gabriel's mother was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And her boyfriend was sentenced to death. This is definitely one of the most sickening cases you will ever hear about or read about. I can't imagine the pain and trauma Gabriel Fernandez was going through while being tortured by his own mother and her boyfriend. And this was just complete abuse. They were treating Gabriel like he wasn't even human. I wish the mother got the death penalty too, but life in prison isn't good either. But rest in peace to Gabriel. This case is just gut turning and you did not deserve this at all. However, according to the phrase, you can't make this stuff up. Like I have known the story of real-life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic child, murderer, and cannibal. This is the exact moment the 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was abducted from a coffee stand in Alaska. At around 8 p.m. on February 1st, 2012, Samantha was kidnapped from the Common Grounds coffee stand in Anchorage, Alaska by serial killer Israel Keys. She had been working alone when security footage showed her being approached by Israel, who walked up to the window, pointed a gun at her, and demanded that she turn off the lights. He then bound her hands together, jumped through the window, stuffed napkins into her mouth, and forced her into his truck before taking her back to his house where he lived with his girlfriend and 10-year-old daughter. 
Once at home, he tied her up in a shed in his backyard, went inside to make sure his family was asleep, and then went back out to the shed where he sexually assaulted and strangled Samantha to death. Israel then left her body in the shed and proceeded to go on a two-week-long cruise with his family. Samantha was reported missing the next day and the FBI quickly got involved, but unfortunately it was too late. When Israel returned home from the cruise, he decided to take a ransom photo of Samantha in order to receive money from her parents. He promised that she'd be unharmed if they sent him money. But in order to provide proof of life, he needed to make it look like she was still alive, so he proceeded to braid her hair and do her makeup, and he even went as far as sewing her eyelids open with fishing line. But in all reality, she had already been deceased for two weeks. On February 24th, Israel texted Samantha's boyfriend using her phone and told him to look for a package in a local park, and it was then that the Anchorage police found the ransom photo and the note demanding $30,000. And just wanting their daughter back safely, Samantha's parents paid him the money by depositing it into her bank account that was linked to her debit card, which he had stolen from her. Sadly, Samantha would not be returned to her family, as Israel then dismembered her body and disposed of her remains in Matanuska Lake. Shortly after, he started using her debit card, which alerted authorities right away. He would disguise himself while withdrawing the money, but one ATM security camera caught him driving away in a white Ford Focus, and it was because of this that he would soon be caught. On March 13, 2012, a Texas state trooper located the car in question and started following him until he was speeding, at which point he pulled him over. Inside the car was Israel, and authorities then found Samantha's debit card and cell phone. Once arrested, Israel confessed to Samantha's murder, but he also confessed to much more. He claimed to have started killing people in 1998, and by the time he kidnapped Samantha, he claimed to have also killed 10 other people in multiple states. While incarcerated, Israel took his life by attempted strangulation and using a razor blade. Before he died, he drew 11 skulls in his own blood and wrote, quote, We are one, end quote. These are the worst of the worst videos on the internet explained, and today we're talking about three guys, one hammer. Before I begin, I just want to say, never go searching for this video. Three guys, one hammer was leaked to a United States shock site in 2008. On your screen right now are the killers. The video begins with a man riding a bike down the street. When the killers kick his wheels and strike him with a hammer off the bike. The poor victim was just going for a normal bike ride, but it ended up turning into one of the most brutal murders ever. They then take the victim into the woods where the victim is lying on the ground and it's very clear the victim has already taken a lot of damage. He is semi-conscious and clearly has been struck in the head and face with the hammer. The video then continues to the two boys taking turns smashing the victim's face in with the hammer. And the victim's face is progressively getting worse and worse. It's as if you got a pack of strawberries and just stomped on it. That's exactly what his face looked like. It was completely caved in and red and was 100% unrecognizable. There was blood bubbles as he tried to breathe, his face was just completely mangled and smashed. And if I'm not mistaken, they also put a cardboard box over his head. And the worst part is, the victim was in and out of consciousness throughout the entire video. Also, the sound of him trying to breathe with all the blood and his disfigured face is absolutely horrible. The killers continue hitting the victim's face with the hammer. They then take out a screwdriver and begin stabbing the victim in the stomach countless times. And then the one killer takes the screwdriver and begins stabbing the victim's eyes out all while he's still alive. The victim then tries to cover his eyes, which shows that he is still conscious, which is just so unsettling to watch. The killers put this guy through pure hell. I could only imagine the fear, loneliness, and the pain the victim must have been experiencing. Eventually, the killers got bored and just wanted to finish the job. So they hit the victim in the head with the hammer a couple more times extremely hard, which ends up killing the victim. Another disturbing part that stands out to me in this video is that at one point you can hear a car passing by which turns the killers completely quiet until it passed. And once it did, they just continued brutally murdering the victim. The victim's name was Sergei Yatsanko, and he was just a normal guy going through his normal day. When these demons decided to do this to him, it's just pure murder with no motive at all. Whatever you do, don't search for this. It's not the gore that makes it awful, it's the pure evil that these kids possessed. Because why in the world would you do this for fun? Rest in peace to Sergey, and it's crazy stuff like this happens. I was stalked by a youth pastor for two years. 
So I was about 17 or 18 at the time, and I was leading worship at a youth conference. And this one particular youth pastor, who was every bit of 45 years old, gravitates toward me and makes an effort to be around me as much as possible. And he was very complimentary to me and very spiritual about the compliments he was giving me. Saying things like, God, I just see such an anointing on you. You are so gifted. Never seen anyone lead worship like you. You are, you are so special. You are so unique. God is going to use you. All stuff I wanted to hear at the time. And then he was like, hey, I'm actually having a youth conference at my church in a few months. Would you be willing to lead worship at that conference? I said, absolutely. Didn't think a thing of it. Gave him my phone number and said, yeah, get in touch with me after this weekend. He did get in touch with me. I did do the conference. But after that, he started texting me like every day. This man had two pre-adolescent daughters and a wife, and he started texting me like really, really heavy things, telling me about his marital problems and how his wife just doesn't respect him and doesn't see him as a man of God and how much it's hurting him. Like wanting me to feel sorry for him and be a confidant. He started texting me stuff like that too. He's like, man, you're just the only person I can trust. You're the, you're the only person that I would open up like this to. And I'm starting to feel extremely uncomfortable at this point, right? It gets worse way worse. Even though I had only met his two daughters like literally once for five minutes, he started texting me things like, man, the girls are just really missing their big sister right now. I really think that you should come over to the house sometime and just hang out with the girls. They're constantly asking me, when is Jordan going to come back over? When's our sister coming over? For some reason, I agreed to babysit them one day. I, it, I don't know why. But I took one of my best friends with me. I said, hey, this guy's a little creepy, but he needs a babysitter for his kids. Will you come hang out with me for the day? So I drove over to his house and the guy was clearly disappointed that I had brought a friend. And he was just like, oh. And he put his hands all over me. Like right in front of my friend, he like side hugged me and was like rubbing my back. And was like, I'm just so glad you're here. The girls have really missed you. And my friend was like, she, she agreed with me that this guy was being super creepy. And so I broke contact and he started stalking me on social media commenting on every Facebook post, liking every post. I would block him and he would create new accounts, fake accounts, and start liking every post, commenting on every post. This went on for two years of just creating accounts, stalking me, watching me, getting new numbers and texting me. And he finally backed off after I told him that I'd reported him to the cops. Sometimes through strange and fiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders gradually progressed in violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminated in acts of cannibalism, necrophilia and extreme mutilation. Imagine finding human body parts in your wheelie bin. Kimberly McKenzie was born in Dundee. She moved around the country as a child with her dad Terence and her mum Helen. She left school in Aberdeenshire when she was 16 and moved to Luchers. She got married in 1998 and had her first son the year after. She actually got divorced a couple of years after that and moved to Fife. She then had a daughter and another son. Fast forward to 2015, Kim was struggling with substance issues. She was due to meet her dad one day and he raised the alarm after she failed to show up. Kim had actually been off and on with a local substance dealer named Stephen Jackson, aged 40. They'd recently split up, but due to her substance issues, I think she was still kind of hanging around with him. A few days prior to going missing, she actually got a text on her phone from Stephen saying that she was no longer welcome in his home. She was really confused by this, but she bumped into him in a shop and he actually said that it was his new girlfriend who'd sent the text. His new girlfriend was 29-year-old Michelle Higgins. Now, shortly after this, Kim had actually been round at her best friend Penelope's house, where she saw Penelope's 19-year-old son, Danny. Kim and Danny then went back to Danny's house and Kim actually slept with him. It's believed that when Penelope found out about this the following day, she was absolutely enraged. She was very upset by it and she refused to speak to Kim, but she had no idea that Kim would soon be dead. Now, news spread around the local area that Kim had slept with her best friend's son and Stephen and Michelle found out. It was the 27th of October and Kim had gone round to Stephen's flat in Montrose and would never be seen alive again. While she was there, Stephen beat Kim with a hammer and stabbed her multiple times while Michelle was present. She was stabbed over 40 times. Stephen then cut up Kim's body in the bath and bagged her up. The couple then callously dumped some of Kim's body parts in local bins around the area. Now Kim was missing and police were looking for her and Stephen would soon make an absolutely horrifying confession to his ex-wife. He laughed to her about how he had killed Kim and he'd made fun of her and her weight. 
The ex-wife was obviously horrified and scared and ran to her mum's house to tell her what she'd heard. Meanwhile, Stephen's neighbour found a suspicious bag in one of his bins, so he moved it to another bin. Police turned up at Stephen's house where he told them that he'd cut Kim's body up and fed her to pigs. He was arrested and later found guilty of murder and given 26 years in prison. Michelle was found guilty of helping dispose of Kim's remains and given just eight years in prison. This woman was naked and trapped in cold water for days and this is one of the worst ways somebody has ever died. This is Elizabeth Mary Isherwood who lived in Wales, which is in the UK. And in September of 2017, she was on a vacation. She was staying at a very popular holiday home and the first night that she checked in, other guests staying there reported hearing banging noises coming from her room. Noises they would later say sounded like maintenance. But the disturbing thing is, it wasn't. Okay, so I don't know what an airing cupboard is. I looked up images and I just kept getting pictures that looked like this. But I have no idea, so I don't have an accurate image of the exact room she was found in. But in the middle of the night, it's believed that Elizabeth got up to use the restroom. And she accidentally walked into the airing cupboard. And somehow the door closed behind her and locked her inside. At first, it's believed that Elizabeth was banging on the door and banging on the walls in hopes that somebody would hear her desperately trying to get out. And just to add, she was likely screaming for help also. But not one person came and not one person responded. It is then believed that she began to claw her way out of the room, literally. It was a small room and there was bricks on the walls apparently, so she was trying to dig in between them and make an opening. And the crazy thing is, she did this likely for 24 hours at least. She actually did make a hole in the wall and it's believed that she was a couple inches away from opening the door. But during the process of her digging through the wall, she managed to burst a pipe that was inside the wall and when she did so, water began filling up the room. It was coming from both the ceiling and the walls. And it's definitely worth noting that she was completely naked too. She had nothing in that room to cover herself with and nothing to warm herself up with. And for the next couple of days, she was constantly being rained on by freezing cold water. And she continued to bang and scream, but still nobody came to her rescue. After a few days, maintenance finally went to her room because of a water leakage. And the deceased body of Elizabeth Mary Isherwood was found. She had died from hypothermia and for a couple of days, she slowly froze to death. There's many questions surrounding this case, like who lets a water leak go for days? And why were the other guests just ignoring banging and screaming at a vacation home? Also, there wasn't any daily room cleaning and nobody noticed a waterfall for days. This case is extremely weird and a lot of it doesn't add up. I feel extremely bad for Elizabeth and I can't imagine going out like this. This is just awful and may Elizabeth Mary Isherwood rest in peace. This man is one of the worst pedophiles in the history of England. So this is 28 year old loner Nathan Bake. Nathan was from Cheshire in England, a community known to be relatively safe and happy. Now Nathan worked as a tire mechanic before he was arrested. Coworkers thought that he was a weird kind of loner guy, but he didn't really seem that harmful. But even though he looked normal on the outside, this man was the devil himself. You see, Nathan Bake was the administrator of a website called The Annex. This website was a pedophile's dream. It featured hundreds of thousands of images and videos, and Nathan actually managed 30 staff members that helped run this pedophile website. So to get into the website in the first place, users would have to actually post CP or CSAM videos and images of their own. Then they would be granted access to the library of disturbing content. So Nathan was second in command on the site's hierarchy. And Nathan really loved something called Hurtcore which are images and videos depicting the most severe kinds of abuse of young children and even infant babies. Now, Nathan would regularly post little updates to his fellow pedophiles on the website, and he would frequently post things like, it's happy hour right now, post photos and videos of the boys and girls that make you the most happy. That's a direct quote from a news article. So there have been a number of different people who have been arrested as being a part of this website, including people like a psychiatrist from London, but when police officers finally searched Nathan's home, I don't think they were prepared for what they were about to find. Inside of the house and on all of Nathan's hard drives totaled together, they found hundreds of thousands of CP and CSAM photos and videos. 
Just let that sit for a second with you hundreds of thousands of images and videos on this guy's devices. Nathan also had a 576 page handbook on how to be a pedophile and not get caught. And if you thought this guy couldn't get any worse, he does. You see, Nathan was also the co-creator of a second child abuse website. And he was the head moderator of a page for pedophiles, which provided people with links and resources to find all of the CP and CSAM that they could possibly want. So in total, the Annex website had over 9,000 pedophile members registered at the time that it was captured. But most of those people, as we know with cases like this, are going to evade justice. They'll never be caught. And it's incredibly deeply disturbing that stuff like this continues to happen every single day all across the world. And in cases like this, people don't get punished as severely as I think they should for the level and magnitude of crimes that they commit. You see, at the end of the day, just recently, it was found that Nathan Bake was guilty, but he was only sentenced to 16 years in prison. Hundreds of thousands of images and videos, and he only got 16 years. Now, if that doesn't make you a little bit angry, it definitely should. This is the most cursed song in the world, and I don't recommend listening to it. The song is called Gloomy Sunday, and it was written by a Hungarian composer named Rezo Seris. And many people have actually taken their own lives after listening to the song. Rezo Seris was born in Hungary in 1933, and he was a struggling composer who'd never written a hit song. After his girlfriend left him, he was so depressed that he wrote the song that made him famous, which is called Gloomy Sunday. At first, music publishers would have nothing to do with the song, saying it was too depressing. Eventually, it was released and became a huge success. Delighted that he had finally written a hit song, Saris contacted his ex-girlfriend who inspired the song and attempted to get back together with her. The next day, she took her own life by swallowing poison, and she left a note behind with only two words written on it saying, Gloomy Sunday. As time went on, Gloomy Sunday was connected to a rash of suicides in Hungary. In all, 17 people died. Two people shot themselves while listening to a band playing the song. Several others drowned themselves in a river while clutching the sheet music of Gloomy Sunday. People began to refer to the song as the suicide song and there were rumors that it was cursed. The Hungarian authorities banned the song from being played in public, however, this did not stop the rash of suicides. In Berlin, a young shoekeeper hung herself and beneath her feet they found a copy of Gloomy Sunday. In New York, a pretty secretary gassed herself, leaving behind her request that Gloomy Sunday be played at her funeral. In Vienna, a teenage girl drowned herself while clutching the sheet music. And in Budapest, a shoekeeper took his own life and left a note containing the lyrics of the song. The song's eerie reputation quickly spread around the world and music publishers from America decided to cash in on its notoriety. They released an English translation of the song and soon after, more deaths followed. One man reportedly walked into a club and asked the band to play the suicide song. Then he took out a gun and took his own life. An 82-year-old man put on Gloomy Sunday on his record player and then jumped to his death from his seven-story window. In the early 1940s, the song was banned in England because it was deemed too upsetting for the public. The ban was only recently lifted in 2002. But what's even crazier is that the song's composer could not escape the curse. Rezo Ceres was haunted by all the death and destruction his music had caused, saying, I stand in the midst of this deadly success as an accused man. This fatal fame hurts me. I cried all the disappointments of my heart into this song. And it seems that others with feelings like mine have found their own hurt in it. In 1968, Rezo Ceres took his own life by jumping out of the window in his Budapest apartment building and falling to his death. So yeah, this is Gloomy Sunday, the most cursed song in the world. It goes without saying, but don't listen to this song at all. But if you decide to listen to the song, please be very careful. This poor girl suffered horrifically at the hands of a registered sex offender. And what should have been a beautiful Christmas day in the city of Salisbury, Maryland, turned into a living nightmare. Sarah Foxwell was just 11 years old when she went missing in the dead of night on the 23rd of December, 2009. She lived with her aunt Amy, who was her legal guardian, and she shared a bedroom with her six-year-old sister Emma. They'd gone to bed that night dressed in their Christmas pyjamas, so excited that Christmas was just a few days away. But when her aunt Amy woke up the next morning, she found Sarah's bed completely empty. The only other thing missing was her toothbrush. 
there were absolutely no signs of a break-in and the windows were locked but when Amy checked the back door she found it open. She did keep a spare key in the back garden and she immediately knew that whoever had taken Sarah had known where that key was. Amy asked Sarah's younger sister Emma if she'd seen anything that night and her suspicions were confirmed. The person that took Sarah was Amy's ex-boyfriend. Emma said that she'd pretended to be asleep when she heard somebody enter their bedroom and she'd been terrified. She said that she had seen Tommy take Sarah. Thomas Leggs had dated Amy, but their relationship was over. He was a registered sex offender that had been convicted of sexually assaulting a 12-year-old, two children at a mall and a 16-year-old at a beach. And just a few months before Sarah's disappearance, he had actually been arrested and accused of sexually assaulting a woman after breaking into her house in the middle of the night. He lived in a shed on his parents' property just a few miles from Amy's house and he was out on bond at the time of Sarah's disappearance. He was brought in for questioning but he denied ever being at their house that night. He said that he'd been out at a bar until 1am and he'd then gone home. The police checked his phone and discovered that he'd messaged multiple women that night trying to meet up with one of them but they'd all declined. They also discovered that around the time of Sarah's disappearance his phone had pinged three different cell phone towers so they knew that he wasn't at home like he said he was. A massive search was launched with canine units on the ground and helicopters overhead and on Christmas day 2009 Sarah's body was found. She was found in a wooded area she was laying on her back with her arms stretched up to the sky and her fists clenched. She died in such a horrific way that I'm just gonna put a trigger warning here because the details of her death are really difficult to listen to. Thomas had taken Sarah that night from her bedroom and he'd sexually assaulted her, but he knew full well that she'd be able to identify him. So he knew that he had to kill her. First, he tried to drown her in some muddy water Bits of debris from that water were found in her lungs. But 11-year-old Sarah put up a massive fight against that monster and that didn't kill her straight away. So Thomas went away and he came back with some gasoline. He then poured this gasoline over Sarah's body and lit her on fire. It was evident at her autopsy that from the smoke in her lungs, she was still alive at this point and she died from a mixture of asphyxiation and smoke inhalation. Sarah's toothbrush was found in Thomas's truck and her DNA was found inside his underwear and he was arrested. Due to the brutality of this crime and how horrific Sarah's murder was, the state of Maryland wanted to seek the death penalty, but Thomas took a plea deal. This plea deal meant that Emma's little sister would not have to testify in court and Thomas was given two life sentences without parole, meaning he'll never be released from prison. This is one of the most horrific cases I've heard recently, so please be warned before watching. 29-year-old Taylor Parker has just been sentenced to death for a crime so horrendous that I can't believe a human is capable of this. Regan Simmons Hancock and Taylor had met online. Their online friendship soon blossomed into a real life connection. It was 2022 and Regan was married with a young daughter. She was also eight months pregnant at this time. Taylor was also pregnant, or so it would seem to the outside world. She was posting pregnancy pictures on social media and even hosted a gender reveal party. Little did her loved ones know that she was actually staging the entire thing. Regan and Taylor were really good friends around this time and they were bonding over their pregnancies. Regan even shared a Facebook status thanking Taylor for bringing her around a gift and Starbucks. This was the day before she would be murdered by Taylor. On Taylor's supposed due date, she made her way round to Regan's house in Texas. Shortly after, Regan's mum made a horrifying discovery. Her daughter was face down on the floor, deceased with blood everywhere. Her mum rang the emergency services and they raced to the scene. It became apparent that her baby had been, and again, a massive, massive trigger warning here, ripped out of her stomach and Regan had been stabbed over a hundred times. Meanwhile, Taylor was pulled over for speeding and driving erratically. She'd actually put the baby in her lap with the umbilical cord coming out of her trousers to make it seem like she'd just given birth. 
When the pair were taken to hospital, the horrors of what actually happened became apparent. The newborn baby tragically passed away and Taylor was arrested. She was sentenced to death, but her defense lawyer said that her loved ones should have done more to protect her earlier on when she was pretending to be pregnant. This island has one of the most disturbing histories in America, and no one really knows the full truth behind it. So like I said before, this island was owned by multi-millionaire Francis Sheldon, pictured right here. And Francis and a number of other local men from Michigan, including this guy, Gerald S. Richards, ran a boys camp on the island. They would fly kids to the island on this airstrip, kids from the YMCA and other schools and communities in the area. And both the children and the parents of the children who attended this boys camp were told that this was an island of fun where kids could relax. They had big brothers there. It was going to be totally safe. And this camp ran on this island for a period of years. Then one day, some of the kids who attended the camp began to tell their parents that the counselors or the teachers, the adults that were there on the island, had behaved with them in very, very inappropriate ways. They began telling their friends and parents that they were taken into these cabins pictured here on the island. They were assaulted. They were told to remove all of their clothing and that there were cameras all over the place. Well, it turns out that this guy, the multi-millionaire with political and business connections in the area, Francis Sheldon, was running a massive CP ring. And they had been abusing the children on this island under the guise of bringing them to a boys camp for years, recording all of it, selling it across the world. And some of the more affluent clients of their business were even allowed to take trips to the island themselves to see some of these young boys. Now, this story bears an obvious resemblance to the story of Jeffrey Epstein, but there are some very, very strange things that are happening here that nobody knows about and the government still refuses to talk about to this day. So let's talk about this guy, Gerald S. Richards. He was a gym teacher at a local Catholic school who went down for the crimes and he was heavily involved with every aspect of this business, if you know what I mean. Well, it seems like through his political and business connections, Francis Sheldon was actually tipped off that he was about to be arrested and raided and charged with these horrific crimes. So Francis, before he could be brought to justice for these crimes, he actually fled the country in a personal plane. He then moved to France, got remarried, and died in Amsterdam, and never had to pay for any of the crimes that were committed here. But it's when we start talking about the murders that this story really starts to blow my mind. So take a good look at this guy, Chris Bush. This is Christopher Bush's father, Harold Lee Bush. Now, he was an executive with General Motors and the family was obviously extremely wealthy. They were politically connected and they were very connected to every business in the area. These guys had a lot of power. But back to Christopher Bush, this guy had assaulted a number of children. He'd been let out of prison, let out of jail in a very, very suspicious way, multiple times, put on bail for serious offenses. And he was a alleged associate of the crime ring that was happening on North Fox Island. Meaning that, like I said earlier, he was one of those people who could afford to actually fly out to the island to do things himself. I'm out of time. Follow for part three. This is where it gets juicy.